Well, hello, everyone. This is Al Fadi, and with me here in studios, our dear brother, Dr. J. Smith. For the last episodes, hopefully you've enjoyed everything that we have unpacked for you concerning Mecca and the contradictions between the standard Islamic narrative and factual findings. And we've elected that today's episode will be a wrap-up for all of that to kind of give you a summary of things. Hopefully, you can use when you are engaged with our Muslim friends. And if you're a Muslim watching this, we welcome you as always. And we want you to take these bullet points that we'll be sharing with you one by one. And feel free to examine the evidence. And feel free even to interact with us and send us anything you believe, you believe is factual, historical, that can refute any of the points that we have shared with you. And at the same time, we want you to be honest and fair to yourself. Go and check the evidence that we have provided you. Otherwise, you are really missing out on a great opportunity and that's your own salvation. Because at the end of the day, our hope for you is to come to Jesus. That's what we want you to do. Not for our gain, we are saved. We know where we're going. We follow Christ but for your sake and for the sake of your eternity. And that's what we hope for, is that you will consider coming to Christ after examining this evidence, because we're not trying to really gain anything out of this. Rather, we could be sitting on the beach right now, drinking coffee and doing nothing. But because we love you and we care for you, we would like for you to at least consider the evidence that we are sharing with you. With that in mind, Dr. J, I give you the honor, of course, of wrapping up this particular series for us. Okay, and we're going to be going back and just doing a recap of what we did. Number one, we saw that Mecca is important for Muslims because it is the earliest uh, and most important city in the history of mankind. We show that according to the traditions, not according to the Quran, because the Quran only references it once in chapter 48, verse 24, but and it just says it's, it's in a valley which doesn't make sense because it's not in a valley, it's in a plain. But what we do know is it is where Adam and Eve were cast down to in chapter 7, verse 24. They were cast down, as we noticed that Adam, unfortunately, was cast down to Kedah and Eve was cast down to Mecca. And he had to come and find her and come up and stride up there 90 foot tall and make it to Mecca so they could be rejoined. So that happens at Arafat, the hill of Arafat that is part of the Hajj. Uh, it is where we noticed, we went through and showed that there was anywhere from 70 to 300 prophets who were buried there. Why? Because they lived in Mecca. You get buried where you live. You get buried within 24 hours, according to tradition. So it means that they were all living there. And look at these prophets. They're Hud and Saleh and uh, Abraham and even the Queen of Sheba. I had no idea that someone of her way down in the Saban, way down there, would be buried up as way up into hundreds of miles away up in the, uh, well, for there, north from what is today Yemen. So all these, but they're not just buried there. They were buried alive and they were buried praying mm -hmm. in a praying position, which suggests that they don't deteriorate. That's what it says. They don't deteriorate. They're always praying. Why were they buried if they're still alive? <laughs> well, that's the first question. But if they're still there in a praying position, why is it all these cranes that we saw pictures of where they're digging these foundations to build these enormous structures, the fourth highest building in the world, that when you build down and you dig down to get the foundations, you have to be, you come across these prophets because they're all being buried right around the Kaaba. 300 of them right. right around the Kaaba. Why haven't they found one of them? That's right. I mean, anything, not necessarily just the body, but anything to indicate a grave site, you know, artifacts, whatever the case might be. Now, the reason why is that everything we know about Mecca, everything that's told us about Mecca does not come from the time period that Mecca existed. If it did exist, it didn't come from the 7th century when Muhammad was living there. He was there in the 6th century, actually, 570 is when he was born. And his father was there, his mother was there, Aminia and Abdullah. So therefore, they're from Mecca. Uh, they're, 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 it doesn't come from the 7th century when he was living there up until 622, when he went up to Medina. We can't find any of this reference for this place called Mecca. We can't find any reference for this place called Me uh, Mecca because they're all of the what we know about these stories about Muhammad, about Abdullah, about Abdullah, Amina, about everything that Muhammad did there in Mecca. All of these stories come from Ibn Hisham, 833, Al Buhari, 870, Sahih Muslim, 875. You notice 800, 800. That's 9th century. The Tafsir and the Tahrik, 
Al-Tabri, Baidawi, Zamakshari, that's 923 and later. That's the 10th century. So all that were dependent upon on that place called Mecca comes from the 9th and 10th century, not even from the 8th century and certainly not from the 7th century. So it's two to three hundreds away. And what's more, take a look where these guys, Bukhara from Uzbekistan, Tabari from Tabaristan in Iran, Hisham grew up in Iraq and then he actually, actually he was born there in Iraq, but he actually grew up uh, in what is today Cairo. Mm -hmm. It wasn't called Cairo, it was called Fustat back then. So he did his work in Baghdad. That's that's 1,100 miles away, 1,120 miles away from Mecca. So you can see this is all too far north and too far distant. More than that, we know that, uh, that Mecca was not even referred to. We can't find any reference. And Dr. Patricia Corona did this. She went to try to find the first reference to Mecca. Remember, this woman reads and writes 15 languages. And the first reference was the Byzantium Arabica. That is from 741. 741 is the mid 8th century. Much, much, much too late. So that area, and she didn't look at the whole reference. If she looked at the whole reference, she would have seen that that place in 741 is located between Edessa and Haran, which is way up in southern Turkey way up in the north again. Mm -hmm. That's even further north than Syria. That's even further north than Iraq. And it seems because of this lack of history, because they can't find any reference yet, because all the archaeologists cannot find these prophets praying, and because of the fact when they build these huge buildings and dug those huge foundations, they haven't been able to find any artifact, what is it they're doing? Well, as we saw from the pictures, they're cementing everything over. They're making a huge cement well, it's a huge amount of artifacts, but that cement suggests to me that they are censoring it. They're censoring it so that nobody can find it. Why is there no history for Mecca? Well, there's a reason why, and we talked about this. And the reason is, now you know, what's the meme that I introduced you? There is no water. What happens, al Fadi, when there's no water? You can't find civilization. There's no food. What happens when there's no food? There are no people. No people. When there's no people, there are no towns. When there are no towns, there are no cities. When there are no cities, there is no civilization. When there's no civilization, there is no history. It's as simple as that. No water, no history. You've got to have water. Listen, we saw this. We started with the whole this discovery, the whole discovery they found there in Mars uh, just the last end of 2021 when the Russians and the Europeans found that. And that was a big hoopla. Everybody talked about it. The same thing I would ask. They would make. They need to find this water also in Mecca, at least before the 7th century, and there is no water from the 7th century. So we then uh, asked that, that not only is it there's no water, it's also isolated. Patricia Corona brought this up back in the 1980s when she said, take a look at the map of Mecca. And take a look at the 7th century map of Mecca. Not today, but the 7th century. And you'll see that this trade route starts in Aden, goes up to Sana, then goes up to Nazareth, and then goes up to Taif, then goes up to Yathrib, and then goes on up to Khaybar, then up to Tabuk, and then up, finally up to Gaza. That, well, Petra, then Gaza. That's the trade route, well known. Lots of documentations for that, but what's fascinating, what's missing in that list of names? What's the one place it's missing? Mecca. Mecca. Yeah. Mecca is not there for one very good reason. And we showed the topographical map. We showed that topographical map. And we showed where you look and you'll see there is a Western plateau. It's very distinct on the topographical map. And all those cities are along the Western plateau. Why? Because that's where the oasis are. That's where the water was kept. And that's why every one of those towns were oasis where the camels would stop because they had water. And when there's water, there is food. And when there are food, there are people. And when there are people, there camels can come and eat the food and drink the water. So that makes sense. There is no uh, water, there was no food because it's a thousand meters off the Western Plateau. It's down off the plateau. To say nothing of the fact, as she said, you'd have to go down a thousand meters, that's 3,000 feet, to a place that had no water, no food. How can you therefore secure your camera, little camels there? And once you do that, then you have to come back up a thousand meters to get back up to Yathrib to get back on the trade right. again. That's right. So can you see that not only is there no land trade route, we also found out that there's no sea trade route either. Mm -hmm. Because in order to go up the sea, you have to go up the eastern coast to get to Mecca and you have to go to Jeddah. Uh, and we know that there was no Jeddah because that was not in all, that was not even built until the 8th century. Gerald Hotting, my professor, back in the 1990s, he wrote the book about it, and he was one that showed very clear there is no reference to this place called Jeddah. And the only reason that Jeddah was, existed is because it was needed to give the food and water that's missing to begin with. Mm -hmm. Once Mecca was chosen, they needed to be, they needed to have water, they needed to have food. So Jeddah was created for that very reason, to bring all the provisions up there, like Yamba, Yamba, as you call her, Yambu, however you pronounce it. Yamba. Yamba. 
it was existed to provide all the provisions for Yathrib, you needed to have Jeddah to do that for Mecca. So there's no water, there's no food, there's nothing. Now, we then asked about civilizations. Mm -hmm. We wanted to see if there's any civilization that knew about this, because certainly people who were in that area, and we went through all the different civilizations, the Western Arabian, we went to the Eastern Arabian, we went to Himyad, we went to the Sabaeans, we, we went to the Patriarchs, uh, we went to the Assyrians, we went to the Babylonians, we went to the Persians, we went to the Romans. We tried to find any place, anybody, anywhere that they knew about this place called Mecca, and none of these civilizations. Remember when we showed that map, we showed all these red rectangles and red circles. They just surrounded Mecca, including the Western Arabian civilization, which is right where Mecca is. And yet none of them had heard about this place called Mecca. If this is where Adam and Eve lived, if this is where Abraham lived, if this is where Muhammad lived, someone somewhere should have known about it. No one, no one seems to know about it. Now, we then we ask the question that Muslims brought up, and that is, okay, so you don't have water, what about the Zum Zum well? And this is the one that got you a little uncomfortable because you love that water. You've grown up with that water. Well, I mean, uh, definitely. I mean, I can think like a Muslim, you know, hearing the information. Uh, it's hard for them to process the fact that they've been living a lie all of their life concerning a story that doesn't even historically exist. Well, here's a man who is a convert to Islam named David Chappell. And we started out with him because I thought it's incredulous. A man who should know better to make these kind of stupid statements that it's inexhaustible. It, is, it can accommodate as many people as needed because God gives it to you without realizing, shouldn't you do a little bit more investigation before you, you, you jump onto that bandwagon? And as I we went and Googled it, Mel was the one that got me onto this. I've been working on it with my team, but Mel says, why don't you just Google it and see how simple this is? Because once I started Googling and I realized, goodness sakes, it's all right there. This has nothing to do with the Zum Zum well. There are pipes going into it, there are pipes coming out of it, and that's just for the people in, in the Haram itself. Uh, Haram and Makki. But there are two million people that live in Mecca. There are another millions that want it all over the world. Where does that come from? Even the water that's there to accommodate the people. Why do you think the pipes are coming from? Where do the pipes come from? They come from those desalination plants. This has nothing to do with God. This has nothing to do with a miracle because we know who, even who constructed those desalination plants. They are Akiona. They are Bechtel. These are Canadian and American desalination plants that are all over Saudi Arabia. There's 27 of them that are on the coasts for one very good reason. There's an awful lot of people that need an awful lot of water. And yes, they even purify it. And the purification plants are also built by Akiona and by Bechtel. And they're right outside of Mecca. They storm in those enormous containers so that people can have what they consider to be the nectar of heaven. It has nothing to do with heaven. It has everything to do with technology that's all run by oil. And that's, as we said, that's not the water you need. The real water you need is Jesus Christ. Amen. The living water. Amen. And that's why we ask, we say it always when we say to people, if you really want water, don't go to the Zum Zum Well. Forget about, forget about Mecca. You can't find the place. It didn't exist at the time of, of Muhammad. It didn't even exist at the time of Abraham. And it certainly didn't exist at the time of Adam and Eve. If the place you need to come to is Jesus Christ. He is Amen. the real water. He is the living water. He is the one that gives them water that is everlasting. It's not something that you just quit, get quenched with within 24 hours. That will be something that they can have for eternity. When it all comes down to it, it all comes back to Jesus Christ, doesn't it? Amen. Amen. And then we closed, of course, with the five stages. The five uh, stages are what's interesting to me because this is, and it's one thing that you brought up that I thought was great. Um, when you look at the five stages, it, they're all to do with idolatry. Yeah. And you brought Very up clearly. Something. Yeah. Because you have been there, you have done these five stages, you see that the Kaaba itself is a rock. It has a rock on the side on the eastern corner. Uh, you see that these stones, anywhere from 49 to 72 stones, are throwing at these jambarats. These, now it's up to three jambarats, used to be only be one, and the narrative even changes to accommodate that. Uh, you see that these two stones that they run back and forth, are supposed to be mountains, now they're stones. So in some ways, like we've said all the way through, Islam takes that which is there and bastardizes it and, re and actually uh, minimizes it. From mountains, they're now little stones. From the, the Mount Moriah, it becomes nothing more than a stone called Marwa. Right. Uh, from the 
Table Mount or the Holy of Holies, the Holy of Holies, which its temple used to belong to, uh, which was where the temple was built there on Mount Moriah, where Abraham was asked to sacrifice his son. It becomes now a square building that they circumambulate seven times without even knowing why they do it, not even understanding that this is the holy number that God had instituted that they, Joshua should do when he goes around Jericho. All of this bastardizes everything until you, especially when you get to the black stone. The black stone really shuts it right down for me because that is as idolatrous as you can get. And I have yet to see a Muslim. I used to ask us all the time at speakers, what in the world are you praying towards about stone? He says, we're not praying to it. I said, yes, you are. Five times a day, you're praying towards that stone. When you go to Mecca, you have to go kiss that stone to forgive your sins. You don't have to go to a stone to forgive your sins because that is idolatrous as you can get. You claim that we're idolatrous. Look at the idolatry based on a stone that you kiss. Why don't you come back to the only one who can really forgive your sins? And it always comes back to Jesus. It's Jesus Amen. who died on a cross to forgive our sins. There's not a thing we could do about it, folks. You can't go Amen. five, seven times around and kiss a stone and hope that that's going to do it for you. You cannot do it. There's not a thing we can do because we are so sinful ourselves. God is a holy God. He, can't be, he, dare, he cannot be in the presence of sin. Habakkuk chapter 1, verse 13. In order for us to get into God's presence again, we need to come back to Jesus Christ because he did it all for us. There's not a thing you can do. Get rid of Mecca has nothing to do with Mecca, has nothing to do with the Kaaba, has nothing to do with that stone on the corner of the Kaaba. It all comes back to Jesus. Amen, brother. Amen. And as I concluded last time, telling you to really take a good look at that amazing slide that has all these images of stones and ask yourself this question if you're a Muslim, can you be a Muslim without touching and circumventing or throwing or kissing these stones or running between stones. Just ask yourself this question. If, if you felt disturbed by the imagery, if you began to realize these are stones representing idolatry, and even if you wanna take it out and say, I don't wanna do these things, in this case, can you call yourself a Muslim? The answer would be no, because it's one of the pillars of Islam. You have to do these things and therefore, there lies the question, the most important one. Do you really think that God can be worshiped through stones? Because my understanding that Islam came to destroy idolatry. In fact, we are accused of being idolaters because we have a cross and the claim is that we worship the cross. Nowhere ever that any of us claim to worship a cross. We worship God. The cross is a symbol for us that washed away our sin because the Son of God died on that cross. That's what we really cherish when it comes to the cross, symbolizes reminder, I should say, a reminder for us that our sins are forgiven. My sin is not forgiven because I touched the black stone. Ask yourself this, how can a stone forgive your sin? But the living God can forgive your sins. And that's our invitation to you, as my brother says, come to Jesus. He's the way, the truth, and the life. Until we meet with you again in another video series, have a blessed day.